good evening to each and every one of you and welcome to the services tonight. Let us remember before we sing our song to all of those are on our prayer list, those at nursing homes, all of those who are sick, the elderly. Let's remember uh, Matt Kuhn has COVID. Let's pray for him. Be in prayer for Brother Ron this Sunday as he will be preaching our morning and evening services. And for Brandon who will be preaching next Wednesday. And for Brother Allen who will be preaching the following Sunday for us. Let's remember Kathy Keelan in our prayers. Uh, there's probably more that, that I don't know of that I haven't mentioned, but the Lord knows who they are. He knows his children very well. If you would, turn to page 352, please. 352, Jesus, lover of my soul.
evening to all of you. Let's, for our scripture reading tonight, go to the Gospel according to Luke and go over to the 24th chapter, Luke chapter 24. This, of course, is uh, after our Lord has been raised from the dead. And uh, two of his disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, uh, very, very troubled in their hearts uh, over the death of their dearest friend and savior. Uh, they had heard word that he had risen from the dead, but uh, they were doubters. And so our Lord, uh, as he does to his people in our times of discomfort, he, he came to them, he comes to us by spirit. He came to these men in the flesh. And so I'll begin reading in verse 13, Luke 24. And behold, two of them, that is two of his disciples, went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, roughly about seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou a stranger? Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a, a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and, and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. And then... The Savior said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave it to them. 
and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight and they said one to another did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread and as they thus spake Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them peace be unto you but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit and he said unto them why are ye troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have and when he had thus spoken he showed them his hands and his feet and while they yet believed not for joy and wonder he said unto them have ye here any meat and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And we'll stop our reading there with verse 48. Blessed passage of scripture in it. And uh, we thank God for these words. Let's bow our heads together. <clears throat> Lord, we bow to come into your holy presence this evening, and we do so upon the merits of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus, who here in this portion revealed himself unto these, his followers, who were in a time of turmoil and trouble, and agonized over his departure, yet not understanding the scriptures that it must be that he lay down his life for the sheep and then take it up again. Thankfully, the Savior opened their hearts and their minds to the word of God. And Lord, by your spirit, you have done the same for for us this evening. Things that were at one time contrary to our understanding. When we read them, we were somewhat confused, didn't really understand what they were all about. But Lord, you have in your sovereign grace opened up our minds and understanding. You have given us a new heart to receive the word of God with joy and to understand the necessity of the death of our Savior, to satisfy all of your demands, 
and to save our poor helpless souls. Thank you, Father, for the understanding you give us continually. We ask that you would continue to show us and teach us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we long to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, which is according to the law, but the righteousness which is received by faith, even the righteousness of our Savior who lived for us and died for us and satisfied your justice. We are right with God because of the doing and the dying of our dear substitute. Open our eyes tonight that we may behold wondrous things from the word of God as we continue our studies in Genesis. May we see the gospel set forth. May we see how that even, even in the book of beginnings, our Lord Jesus is set forth and he is the only savior of sinners. Bless those of our number, those who are watching, who are ailing, those who are in times of affliction. Remind all of your people, Lord, that these are a light affliction, which is only for a moment. Indeed, during times of trouble, these trials can seem very heavy, but they're truly light compared to what we deserve. They're light compared to what our Lord Jesus suffered in our stead. They're light because we have the privilege of casting all of our care upon you knowing, Father, that you care for us. So bless the word of God as it goes forth this evening. Bless your dear people. Speak to us, we ask, through the gospel of grace. For Jesus' sake, I ask these things. Amen. Let's go back to the book of Genesis tonight, uh, Genesis chapter 49. Uh, these are the prophecies of Jacob. The last words of Jacob are here recorded in Genesis chapter 49, the last words to his son. They pertain to what's going to happen, not so much to each individual son, but to those, the, their posterity or their tribe, things that were going to happen in, in the future. And there's no question about it. In this, in this chapter, when he speaks to his sons, there are two great mountain peaks. And, and everything seems to lead to these two. And the mountain peak goes up, and we are introduced again to Judah, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. And then things kind of drop back down, and then once again, we're introduced to Joseph. And there is the second mountain peak in these last words of Jacob to his sons. These are very important things that are spoken. And here we find a gospel, a gospel trail. And we know this. Whenever you open the word of God, it doesn't matter where it is in Genesis or Exodus or any other book of the Old Testament or New Testament, there's always, a, there's always a path that leads you to the Savior. There's no question about that. And if you read a portion of Scripture and you give some diligence in studying it and you don't see, well, I really don't see how the, this passage, this context and reading it, all the verses beforehand and the verses after, afterward, you say, I really don't see how this is a passage that, that is a road map or a path to our Savior. And then you need to read it again and ask for the leadership and the understanding of the Spirit of God. 
The book is about Christ Jesus. This is indeed more than a book of history. It is a book of his story. And so we see this in this passage of scripture. Now, Jacob begins with the birth order of his son, so he goes first to Reuben. Reuben, and Reuben had a great standing with, with Jacob. He's the firstborn. Uh, he had the preeminence in the family. Uh, he, he was a mighty man. The scripture says that in verse 3. He, Jacob says he was the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. He had great dignity. He was somebody. This is the firstborn of the, of the nation of Israel. He's the first one. And he reminds me of Adam. God made man in his own image and there was Adam. My, what a man. His dignity. His uprightness. A man of good character. A man who had no sin. A man of might. But as we read in verse 4, something happened to Reuben. He became unstable as water. And his father said, you will not excel. And we know something happened to Adam. He fell. And God could rightfully say to Adam and to all of Adam's posterity, that's all of us, everybody who is born as a result of a union of a man and a woman, the Lord could say to all of us, thou shalt not excel. You have fallen. You have fallen. In Adam we fell. How far did we fall? All the way to the bottom. We lost our dignity, we lost our excellence, and we became sinful. By one man, the scripture says, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That is, all have sinned in Adam, that representative man. What he did affected all of us, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with that or not, really has no bearing upon the fact of it. You're a sinner. You were born a sinner because Adam did not excel, but rather he fell. He's as unstable as water and that's man at his best state. There is no stability in man. Not even, not even a converted man. I know we're stable in Christ Jesus. We're built on the solid rock. So sovereign grace has put us on Christ, the solid rock. And we have, we have a perfect righteousness in him. But within ourselves, we know there's still a great conflict. There's still sin. And in ourselves, we will never excel. The only way that we have become excellent people is because of our union with the Lord Jesus, who is our righteousness, who is our holiness. Reuben, he fell. See our fall in Adam. Now watch this. Simeon and Levi in verses 5 and 6. Violent men. You notice this about Simeon and Levi. Nothing good is said about them. You see, here, Reuben, to begin with, something good was said about Reuben. But then, like Adam, of whom he was a picture, Reuben was a picture, he fell. And now his brothers... 
his brothers, and I tell you, we're brothers to Adam. Preacher friend of mine was greeting folks as they went out the door, as, as we typically do. And he would say, good morning, brother. Good morning, brother. Good morning, brother. Good morning, sister. Good morning, sister. And somebody said, you didn't even know that guy who just went through. How do you know he's your brother? He said, he's my brother. He said, you don't know that. I said, oh, yeah. I'll catch him in Adam or I'll catch him in Christ. <laughs> but he's my, he's my brother one way or the other. And here, here are the brothers, Simeon and Levi, their brethren. And we're the brethren of Adam. And of Simeon and Levi, it is said, they're instruments in cruelty. That's in their habitations. Instruments of cruelty. Oh, my soul, verse 6, don't come into their secret. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they killed a man, they slew a man. And in their self-will they dig down a wall. Simeon and Levi, they remind me of all of us by nature. We read in Romans chapter 3, the fallen man, feet, their feet, and swift to shed blood. That's the way it is with men. Feet swift to shed blood. And they were especially swift to shed blood when it was the blood of the Son of God. Here's the only true, the true man who lived and walked and communicated with people. This is the God-man, perfect in all of his ways, in every thought, in every motive, in every dream, in every imagination. Everything he said, thought, and did was solely for the glory of God, the only good man who's ever lived, and people were angry with him. They sought to put him out of business. And like Simeon and Levi, those who crucified our Lord Jesus were instruments of cruelty. Instruments of cruelty. They killed a man in their anger. Behold the anger of the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ. In their anger, in their wrath, in their malice, see the high priest as he rent his clothes. You said you're the son of God. Is that right? He said, you said it. Oh, he got so mad, just tore his clothes. And he said to the rest of the court, you heard what he said. What are we going to do with him? Have him crucified in their anger. In their anger. They slew a man. Oh, what a man. <laughs> but watch this. They were instruments of cruelty. You see, an instrument is that which somebody uses, right? A hoe or a rake or a shovel. That's something you use in the kitchen. It's a a frying pan, a spatula, or whatever. Instruments of cruelty. Like Simeon and Levi, those men who had our Lord Jesus crucified, they were instruments, instruments of cruelty, instruments really in the hand of God. Say so they were instruments in the hand of Satan. No disagreement there. But there was a greater hand, an omnipotent hand, the hand that ruled the world, the hand of the sovereign God, 
and he is manipulating everything that had to do with the substitutionary death of his son and those who crucified the Savior were instruments in his hand, instruments of cruelty. And they had no idea that when they put the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, to death, God was using them. Oh, they couldn't make the Lord Jesus the Savior. <laughs> and what they did didn't satisfy justice. But they put him on that cross. And God used that to teach people this is what happens due to sin. There's got to be punishment. There's got to be judgment. And of course, all they could do was punish his body. God punished his soul. So that all that came to pass at the cross of Calvary was God using these men as instruments of cruelty. No wonder in verse 7, Jacob says, Cursed be their anger. It was fierce. And their wrath, for it was cruel. Oh, what a dark picture Jacob has now painted. It starts with Reuben. And Reuben fell. And Reuben, he defiled his father's bed. And then he's followed here by Simeon and Levi, brethren, instruments of cruelty. And you say, Jacob, you're painting such a dark picture. Well, that's what the Word of God does. It shows us we're sinners. We're ungodly. We're helpless people. And then comes the good news. Judah. Ah, there's one who came forth from the tribe of Judah. Even that one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as a lion, he conquered his enemies. He conquered Satan. He conquered our sin. He conquered every, every foe of all of his people. And he laid down his life to satisfy God's righteous judgment. Bearing all the sins of his people in his own body on the tree. And the wrath of God fell on him. And then he said, it's finished. And he bowed his head, gave up the ghost. And the lion went home to glory. And Jacob says, the last statement of verse 9, who shall rouse him up? <laughs> who shall rouse him up? He's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And one of these days, he's going to be roused up for judgment. For judgment. And all those who are in opposition to him, he will deal with them in the fierceness of his wrath. Well, I sure am glad there's some good news here, aren't you? You see how the path, the path of this takes us, it, it paints a black picture. No preacher... I don't care who he is, no matter how gifted, no matter if he's a great orator, has a tremendous grasp of the English language, no preacher is able to fully paint the picture of the blackness and the awfulness of man's transgressions and sin, our de total depravity. It's worse than we can ever imagine. And so no, no pen of the greatest writer, not even an, an angel above, could speak of the wonder, fullness of the wonders of the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ, that one who is Shiloh, Shiloh, the sent one, the Savior of his people. And then... Zebulun. 
in verse 13. A haven. Our Lord Jesus is a haven for poor, weary, wandering, struggling sinners. Find a safe haven for your soul in the Savior. Anchor your, anchor your soul in this haven of rest, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of these days, we will wind up our voyage across the sea of life and we will arrive safely in this haven. We'll see him face to face and be with him forever and ever. Well, in verse 14, here's Issachar. And again, again, the picture is painted dark. He's a strong ass couching down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good. The land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulders to bear and he became a servant to tribute. Isn't it amazing that we find pleasure in sin? We find some degree of satisfaction in the servitude of Satan and the sinfulness. And you see people every day who they're quite contented. They're very happy. They're very happy. To them, it, it's good. It's all good, they say. It's, it's good. <laughs> but what about those burdens you're bearing? Well, it, it's not so bad, really. It's worse than you can imagine because Satan controls you by his own will. And that burden of sin may not seem like much of a burden now, but it's going to be like a millstone around your neck and sink you down to the lowest part of hell someday. And people are contented. They're satisfied. Another evidence of our depravity Surely that's proof that the natural man is absolutely ignorant of his own condition. Don't you know you're standing on the precipice of eternity? You're standing on the verge of hell? Isaiah pictures hell as opening her mouth to swallow up another one. And there you are, and you're standing on the very edge of it, and you're smiling and laughing and jovial seemingly without a care in the world. This was what David, this was what troubled David in the Psalms. He saw, he saw the wicked like a green bay tree. It just it seemed like everything he touched turned to gold. And he said, so foolish was I, I envied him. And then I saw his end. I saw his end. I didn't envy him anymore. Go ahead and have your good time. Enjoy life as you think you're enjoying life. Because you're not going to enjoy anything else unless God saves you by His free and sovereign grace. And then there is Dan, verses 16 and 17. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now, we know there's a book in the Bible named Judges. And, of course, there were several judges for Israel. And with most of the judges, we, we, we talk about them judging Israel. And I, I suspect that most of us have the idea of somebody who's ruling and deciding cases. Really, the word judge is more of the the idea of delivering. a delivered people. That's what a judge did primarily. And of course, out of the tribe of Dan was Samson, the great deliverer. 
And he was a picture of our Lord Jesus in several ways. But most especially in his death. For in his death, he saved many in Israel in killing the enemy. But Dan, the tribe of Dan, was a godless tribe. They got into the land of Israel. Everybody's getting settled and, you know, staking their claim to land, so forth and so on. But the, that, that tribe of Dan, they were looking for land. They went to a house. They sent five spies out to a house of a man by the name of Micah. And they went into the house of Micah. He had his own priest. And he had his own little gods. And those five men of Dan... They were backed up by, what, five or six hundred armed soldiers. Well, those five spies, they go into the house of Mike and they, they stole the uh, priestly garments and the idols. Let me tell you something, and remember this about Dan. The very germ of idolatry in Israel began with Dan. That's, some, that's important to remember. This is where the infection began. And eventually, all the ten northern tribes became idolatrous. And it started with Dan. And they go into this man's house by the name of Micah. They steal his priestly, the priestly garments. And the priest was being kind of held by the armed soldiers at the gates of the city. And this guy said to him, he said, what are you guys doing? You're taking my priestly vestments and you're taking our idols? Those five men said, well, let me ask you a question. Would you rather be a preacher to one, this man Micah, or be a preacher to the whole tribe of Dan? Well, he said, hey, I'm in it for the numbers. <laughs> he said, fooey with Micah. And so they stole Micah's gods and all the priestly vestments. And that's how idolatry found its way into Israel. And then finally, by the time the kingdom divided, remember Saul, then David, then Solomon. At the end of Solomon's reign, the kingdom divided, and Rehoboam, Rehoboam, who became the king of the northern kingdom, he established gods, both in Samaria, which was, had became the capital of the northern kingdom. And I've said this to you before, and most of you who are uh, students of the word of God, you know this, that the northern ten tribes, ten tribes in the north, two in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Those ten tribes in the north, they never had a godly king. Ever. Ever. And Rehoboam, he established, he established idolatry in Samaria and in Dan. And people would go from one to the other. It's about a, if I my math was correctly trying to figure out how many miles in an inch. <laughs> About 160 miles. and So they'd go to conferences. People would travel to conferences from Samaria over into Dan. About 160 miles. And they'd do that every year. Just have a wonderful conference of idolatry. Of idolatry. It was a rotten tribe. You see what sin has done to us? It's made us idolaters. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was Israel? 
these men? Can you imagine their ancestors of the tribe of Dan bowing down to a brazen idol, a golden calf? This is what they did. But you see, man is by nature an idolater. And of this you may be certain. Every person by nature is religious. Oh yeah. Oh, to believe and understand and grasp salvation by grace through a crucified, buried, risen, exalted Savior. Now that, that takes the effectual call of grace. That takes a regenerating work of the Spirit of God. And we're thankful for that. But every man is religious by nature. I don't care who he is. Man's got to have a God. And he will have a God. And oftentimes, the God is himself. And indeed, this was the temptation to Eve from the serpent. Ye shall be as God yourself. You'll be the master of your own fate. <laughs> and nobody's going to tell you what to do. Nobody's going to have any authority over you. You're the final authority in your own life. That's what free willism is. And that's why I say free willism, that's just an idol. Men have made an idol out of man's free will. Oh, that God would crush that idol of free willism, of you're the master of your fate. Oh, that he would crush it in your own heart and in my heart and rip the idols away from us that we may worship only our God and King who made us and who preserves us and who sustains us. Ah, uh, Dan. In Amos chapter 8, you can read more about the idolatry of Dan. People in Samaria, they swore and said, Thy God, O Dan, liveth. Little g. Little g. And like I say in... Samaria and in Dan, there was a golden calf erected over here in Samaria, capital city of the northern kingdom. That's pretty big, capital city. <laughs> golden calf over there and a golden calf in Dan. Well, let's have a Bible conference. We'll go over there this year and we'll come back over there next year. That's what they did. Oh, it wasn't a true Bible conference, though. It was a meeting of the minds of people who were anti-Christ and anti-God and anti-grace. No hope. No hope. You want to know how subtle false religion is? Look at verse 17. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. They had they pulled the wagons in the and they had the ruts, you know, where the wagon wheels turn and the horses would go. And they had these brown adders who would hide in the sand. And they were deadly. And first of all get the horse you was riding, and bring him down, then he'd get you. I'm telling you, false religion, oh, hear me, it is deadly. And it hides, it hides itself where you can't see, you'll think there's nothing wrong at all. It'll sink its teeth into you, and you'll believe the very poison of false religion, of will worship and works worship. That'd be the end of you. Oh, Jacob, you paint another dark picture. Oh, but wait. Verse 18, right, in, right after that. I have waited for thy salvation, O oh Lord. <laughs> oh, good news. 
God has salvation for people who are like Issachar, burdened, and don't even know it. Helpless and don't even know it. For people who are idolaters like Dan, God has his salvation. And Jacob says, I've waited for it. And what he's saying is, I'm waiting for the Savior. I'm waiting for him. Who can get us out of this mess? <laughs> Who's the remedy to our malady? I read these words. Jacob said, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. I think of the words of a man in the book of Luke chapter 2 by the name of Simeon. And he saw the Lord Jesus being carried in the arms of Joseph and Mary. The Spirit of God had said, you're going to live. I'll make sure you live till you see the Lord's Christ, till you see his salvation. The Savior came in, wasn't a halo over his head. Looked like any other little baby boy. But the Spirit of God said, that's the one right there. That's who you're waiting for. <laughs> that's who you're waiting for. Well, it looked ordinary to me. And he looked ordinary to most everybody else too. Does he look ordinary to you? Or do you see in his face the very glory of God? Simeon's heart his heart beat faster. He said, Lord, I'm ready to die now. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I've been waiting for it. I've been waiting for it. I've been trusting that he'll come. And here he is. And then Anna came in and she, she saw him. She just rejoiced and she began to tell everybody who was looking for redemption in Jerusalem. She said, he's here, he's come. You know what, Jacob didn't see a, he didn't see a plan. It wasn't a plan of salvation, it was a person. I won't ever forget, I don't think as long as I've got some mental faculties that halfway work, <laughs> I'll never forget in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, many years ago, some 50 years ago, a preacher from this very church, Brother Mahan was preaching, came to hold a meeting for us. I had some, I had some, I had right doctrine. But like Brother Barnard said, you can have right doctrine, you can be as straight as a gun barrel and just as empty. I was, I was kind of empty. And I, I, I've been preaching salvation's in a plan. It's in a, God's plan of salvation. And back when I was an Armenian preacher, I had God's simple plan of salvation, if you ever saw that track. And it's still out, God's simple plan. God's simple plan of salvation. But anyway, I'd been saying that and Henry was preaching and God used him. It was, it was like nobody else was there but me. He said, you've heard of God's simple plan of salvation. It's not a plan. God's salvation is a person. That's what he said. <laughs> Oh, whoa. <laughs> it, it just hit me. Hit me right in the heart. <laughs> and I ain't got over it to this day. And I, I thank God for any man, doesn't matter whether it's Henry, Bill, even me or any other preacher, I am so thankful for that man who will get behind the pulpit and say, God's salvation is somebody. The Lord Jesus Christ in his work of redemption. 
Well, I tell you, it's a blessed day when it hits your heart, isn't it? <laughs> when it hits your heart. Don't get over that. You get over religion, religious experience. You get over that emotionalism. I tell you what, when God takes the air of His grace and He aims it at your heart, that's the target. And when He shoots at a target, He doesn't miss. <laughs> he hits the target. You'll know, you'll know who shot the arrow and you'll know you've been hit. <laughs> oh boy. And old Jacob says, I've, I've waited. He's on his deathbed. I'm, I'm still waiting. I'll tell you what, Jacob. You only have to wait a few more minutes. <laughs> and you're going to put your feet up in the bed and lay back down and homeward you're going to go. And you'll see the Savior face to face. Uh, there's always a gospel road to Christ. Find it and stay on it. Well, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the glorious gospel of grace. And we know you, you do indeed paint a dark picture of our depravity and our sinfulness. Like Reuben, Adam started off great. And in Adam, we all did. But Adam, like Reuben, became unstable as water. And we fell. And like Simeon and Levi, cruel, angry against the Son of God. Thank you, O Lord, for sending one out of the tribe of Judah even that one who is our Savior. And our hearts are made again to rejoice in Him. And how thankful we are that we have been brought to know Him, whom to know is life everlasting. We rejoice in Him. And we're thankful that you've given us eyes to see a path in these places passages of scripture that always lead to the dear Savior and our hearts are made to rejoice. And in a sense like Jacob we say I've waited for thy salvation O Lord. We're waiting and looking forward to the day when we shall see our Savior who is salvation. Salvation's a person. Simeon said, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. O oh, glorious day when the Spirit of God opens our eyes and we behold the glories and the beauties of Christ our Savior. And what a wonderful day it will be when we shall leave this world and see Him and we'll see Him face to face and be with Him forever. So bless the word of God that's gone forth tonight. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.